And our last speaker before we move to the discussion and Q&A, which by the way, you can contribute to, you can see there's a, an option to add your questions to any of the speakers, or you can also throw any oddballs you want of challenging questions that you want the perspective of the speakers, even if it's not directly related to something they, they mentioned, you know, we're open to such challenges. So please feel free to do that. Uh, so before we move on, our last speaker is Professor Toby Erb, uh, who is also the director of the Max Planck Institute at Marburg. He's uh, really doing fantastic work as a leader in research on synthetic metabolic pathways that I'm sure you'll uh, be amazed with very soon. Uh, but he initially planned to become a science journalist uh, until he fell in love with the lab, uh, where still he often uh, finds himself, he was stuck with his experiments and had to go for long runs to help him. He and his team want to push the boundaries of what is experimentally possible, uh, even though they are told that their ideas will never work out, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Please tell us the most recent update, Toby. Okay, so thanks again for this invitation. I'm really excited to speak about our research in which we want to use our understanding of natural CO2 fixation to create new ways and uh, new to nature photosynthesis, basically rethink, redesign and reconstruct uh, new ways how light driven carbon capture uh, can actually happen uh, inside of living cells. And really all our efforts focus currently on this small molecule here, CO2, which you all know, a very important greenhouse gas, and of which you also know that we have been started to concentrate it in the atmosphere in last years, decades, even centuries. Uh, so we human beings have been influencing the atmospheric CO2 pool quite a lot. And of course, you all know there's a dire need, a dire need to find new ways to basically uh, recapture this atmospheric CO2 and convert it, store it, or make something useful out of it. And that's a big vision, of course, uh, for us to heal the planet, to come back to equilibrium. But of course, you also know the technological challenges uh, that chemistry cannot simply just, uh, you cannot simply run a, a chemical process to refix the CO2, which is so finely concentrated. And so we're still stuck in terms of technologies, at least chemical technologies, but you also know that there's actually a biological process that is operating at a large planetary scale. And this is, of course, photosynthesis. It's nothing else than light-driven carbon capture and conversion. And this whole thing operates at a level of 100 gigatons carbon per year as Ron actually nicely calculated. So I'm telling you, there is a biological solution and the solution is quite powerful, but still it's not enough to compensate what we humans do to the global carbon cycle. So the question of course is why is it not enough? Why is photosynthesis not able to compensate? And there's many thoughts and research done on this just want to focus on a, a very simple observation, maybe one of the main explanations, and that is that biological CO2 fixation is basically stuck in the way it fixes, uh, captures and converts CO2. And it all comes down basically to the central enzyme, the central catalyst, if you want to say so, the engine that drives photosynthesis of carbon capture and conversion. And this is an enzyme that you all know uh, called Rubisco, which introduces carbon dioxide to the Calvin cycle into plant metabolism. And what's interesting about this enzyme is, and I think Ron has also done all these calculations in the past. So this enzyme is quite a, a slow enzyme, at least slow compared to many other enzymes. It takes only five CO2 molecules per second compared to many other enzymes, which would be able to operate at hundreds of thousands, a hundred thousand molecules per second. And interestingly, at the same time, the enzyme is also sloppy. It actually makes a lot of mistakes. And so it can, of course, accept CO2, but it can also accept oxygen. And in fact, the uh, average Rubisco would have an error rate of approximately 20%, which means every fifth time, instead of fixing a CO2 molecule, Rubisco would fix an oxygen molecule. This would lead to a process called photorespiration. And this process, again, wastes energy, releases CO2, and limits, if you want to say so, photosynthesis by a factor of 20 to 30%. Now, on top of everything, a plant leaf is fully packed with this enzyme. And you can tell already from that, basically the Calvin cycle biological CO2 fixation in the plant context is running at its limits. It's like a car you drive full speed and it's pretty hard to improve that. I think many people have tried to improve Fubisco, have tried to improve the Calvin cycle and we have not done that, but we have thought about a different way, trying an outside of the box approach and asking ourselves, instead of improving Rubisco, instead of improving the Calvin cycle, instead of improving existing photosynthesis, 
can we actually think of other ways, new to nature pathways, new to nature enzymes, newly discovered enzymes, new metabolic pathways we could think of that we could build and maybe realize in the context of a living organism. And this would be synthetic photosynthesis or photosynthesis 2.0, man or human made. All right. So of course you can ask, is this possible? Uh, can, can we actually reinvent such a central process? And I can tell you, we take a le lesson from the nature and we can see that nature already has done this to some extent because nature has evolved several different pathways beside the Calvin cycle. Notably, of course, in microorganisms, Diane is nodding her head. That's what I'm saying when nature has been creative. Nature has found different solutions. And as a biologist, I'm amazed by these seven other pathways that exist and run in different microorganisms. But as a synthetic biologist, biologist I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed because nature missed out on many other opportunities. So you can look at those pathways of this enzyme, you can connect them a different way. And something that Ron and Aaron Bevan has also done in the past, thinking what else could actually exist and why did nature choose one of the other solution? And this is now really synthetic biology. You try to explore the landscape, the metabolic landscape, which nature has not touched or not explored yet. And it's different from metabolic engineering. We try to improve something that exists. We try to build something new that you, doesn't exist in nature yet. All right, so how are you going to do this? Well, in principle, we have two phases. First of all, you think hard, what would be a perfect CO2 fixation cycle? What would a perfect photosynthetic pathway look like? You then move ahead and you try to find the individual parts, the enzymes, the proteins you would need to build the system, molecular components. You build the molecular system, the pathway that fixes CO2. And then you optimize it. And ideally, you transplant it inside of a cellular system, which could be a natural cell, a natural microorganism, or it could be an artificial cell. I'll talk about both of it in a minute. And eventually, at some point, you're going to move it into a higher organism where actually scaling can take place. All right. But we start first with designing new to nature pathways. How do we do that? Well, in principle, we just sit really at a table. We have a white paper in front of us, a blackboard, and we just draw a hypothetical, theoretical, potential pathways. It's called paper biochemistry or metabolic retrosynthesis if you're a chemist by training. But you see here, some of these ideas we've had, and I think Ron and Aaron had many other great ideas. The point is you can be super creative because you have so many opportunities. And so these are a couple of examples we've drawn. But of course, the question is which of these examples you draw is a good and efficient pathway. So which of those are really pathways that would make sense to build? Or if you're a PhD candidate, of course, which of these pathways gives you a nice thesis or a paper at the end of the day where it can be successful? Well, the point is we use very simple physical chemical parameters that we know from metabolic uh, pathway design that we know from, uh, from natural physiology. We basically pay attention to kinetics, which means the speed of reactions. We wanna use enzymes or pathways or reactions that are very, very fast and efficient. And one example is here, we don't use Rubisco, which is a very slow enzyme. We use another enzyme called ECR that can fix carbon dioxide that we discovered 10 years ago in a microorganism from the soil, which outcompetes Rubisco by a factor of 20, which means within the same time, you can actually fix 20 times more CO2. And naturally, a cycle that uses this enzyme would be able to cycle 20 times faster and fix 20 times more CO2. And second, we pay attention to thermodynamics. So the question is how much energy do you have to spend if you want to fix one CO2 molecule? And again, you can make some predictions. You can talk about and think about potential ATP requiring steps, potential reduction steps, and you can have a matrix where you calculate all this energy that needs to go into the fixation of carbon dioxide to make a certain product. What you see here is that the catch cycle we had designed in the lab, the initial version of it, is actually two times more ATP efficient then the Calvin cycle, which means to fix one molecule of CO2, you need only half of the ATP that you would need in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the Calvin cycle. And looking from that very simple parameters, faster and more ATP efficient, you would say this would be a very nice solution to be realized in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the lab. Now comes the hard part. The hard part is actually how to build this system. Because what we've done is just thought about a potential hypothetical pathway. And we need to find now enzymes that we can use to realize and put all this very complex CO2 fixation machine together. And for that, we need the community. We need people who discover new enzymes. We need people to describe the diversity and the metabolic potential of enzymes. We need resources, we just heard from Ron, that is, are able to, 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 we are able to browse to identify potential candidates to at the end of the day, build the system in the lab. And I just highlight two, uh, two resources. One is the Enzyme Function Initiative. Uh, the other is basically Brenda, a simple classical database. 
And of course, we just heard about Magnify, which is also a great resource for us. So looking, searching for enzymes we can use to build the system. And we really don't care where the enzymes are from. If they are from alpha proteobacterium, methylobacterium, rhodobacter, if they are from gram-positive clostridia, E. coli, archaea, human liver, really, we really just pick and pack the best enzyme in our, in our mind that we could use to build the system. And all together uh, to build the first we have a catch cycle, we combined 15 different enzymes from six different organisms and even one engineered enzyme to build the first version of the cycle. And we could really show that if you bring all these 15 enzymes together, you throw in energy, ATP and DPH and CO2, the system starts to turn and it starts to fix CO2, which is great because it tells you, you can really rethink and rebuild the complete new C2 fixation cycle from first principles. However, what we also learned is that our design was heavily flawed because the CO2 fixation feature was super, super, super low. And even though we thought so hard about the individual enzymes, we did not manage to build a biological system that was operating at, uh, at, at high efficiency. And why is that the case? Well, the challenge is that biological engineering is not physical engineering. The parts are not perfect. The parts are not uh, catalyzing it without doing any, any other stuff and the parts co-evolve with each other. What I'm telling you is that if you bring in things from very different biological backgrounds, we need to spend a lot of time to optimize the system, or in other words, we need to mimic evolution to make the system more robust and more efficient. And this is what we did in the lab over different rounds, building a version one, two, three, four, five, and just implementing things we already know, shaping, for instance, the specificity of enzymes, redesigning certain, uh, certain parts of the pathway, or introducing enzymes that remove toxic products to make the system more robust and improve it by a factor of 20, but just implementing all these different, uh, different principles that we know that evolution is playing on. So we build a system now with 17 different enzymes from nine different organisms, three re-engineered enzymes, and the system in vitro is already at the level where you would be able to measure if you just measure the Calvin cycle and you break, uh, let's say, plant leaf and try to measure CO2 fixation. That's very impressive. But of course, it's not the end, right? In real evolution, you could give even further. The problem is, how do you do this in such a complex setup? So how can you systematically explore the optimum of your system? And this is, I think, where, again, bioinformatics, lab automation, and machine learning comes into play. So what we did in the last year is basically setting up many different variants of the cycle using an acoustic dispenser, miniaturizing the catch cycle in vitro in very small 384 wheel plates and running hundreds to thousands different variants, analyzing which of these different variants shows the best results, feeding it back into a machine learning algorithm and letting predict the next set of experiments. And what you see here is, over the 10, eight to 10 days, you actually improve the system by a factor of 10, just using now, let's say, machine learning to mimic evolution uh, in, in, in an in vitro setup. And now I think we are really at a stage where we can, uh, can really think about implementing a system as a robust system inside of a natural or synthetic cell. Well, this brings me now to the comparison, what is happening in natural chloroplasts and what's happening, let's say, in artificial chloroplasts. So how, 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 how far can we actually get in building a light-driven, light-powered in vitro system? LDA, you need two things. You need to power the system with ATP and ADPH through light, and you want to confine the reaction inside of a compartment like in a real chloroplast. So the first part, can you take a synthetic cycle and hook it up to the photosynthetic machinery of spinach, for instance? So can we use the synthetic system and couple it to the natural system? Actually, it's not possible because, again, there is no co-evolution, and you have to think hard and identify the weak spots and those enzymes that make problems. You switch parts again, two parts in this case, and suddenly the light-driven machinery of spinach chloroplasts can fix carbon dioxide in combination with our synthetic catch cycle. We can further encapsulate the whole things with a technology called microfluidics, and we create really inside of very small cell-sized droplets, a system where we have the thylakoid, the chloroplast membranes, as well as our synthetic cycle, we can shine light on these droplets. We can power them up and you see here's NADPH, that's the energy source. And then the NADPH can be used by the catch cycle to fix carbon dioxide. And we actually can show that this works at least for two hours. All right, this is the idea of an artificial cell, an artificial chloroplast, a human made, let's say, biologic-like structure at the interface of chemistry, biology, material sciences. But of course it would be even greater if you could take now this new to nature path and put it back inside of a living cell. And so or another comparison would be, let's take this pathway, this 
new software we've just de uh, designed and try to run it on an existing hardware. Let's say an E. coli cell first, and then maybe later on in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a plant. So are we going to do this? Well, this is work that's also been pioneered by Ron in the past. You actually make the cells addicted to your pathways, right? So you, let's say for the catch cycle, you isolate one metabolite that's essential for the cell. In this case, succinyl a citric acid cycle intermediate. You create all pathways leading to succinyl-CoA and that the cell is really dependent on this compound. And you bring back in now the catch cycle or part of the catch cycle. And only if the catch cycle is functioning, it would allow the cell to make succinyl-CoA and the cell could start to grow again. And this in fact would have been doing the last three years and uh, lo and behold, we could really show that in the meanwhile, if you put in the catch cycle in E. coli and we make it addicted on it, it really starts to grow, which is a first step of bringing this new to nature metabolic pathway network into the context of a living cell and hopefully harnessing and leveraging evolution to further improve it in the future. All right, uh, one thing I wanna mention of course is even though we have made a lot of progress thanks to many great scientists in, 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 in our team, I think one thing is for sure the small droplets or the E. coli cells uh, growing a little bit in the flask in, in the lab won't save the world from global warming. But we have learned what are the building principles of metabolic networks. We've learned what does it take us to rebuild and redesign new metabolic pathways. Can we mimic evolution and can we transplant it inside of living cells? And I think we've gotten a lot of insights, insight we can use now to think about real world application in the future. And those might be down the road 20 years from now, and you might be the people implementing it and harnessing these principles. But I think we're on a very good track, at least in this respect, uh, looking at this design, build and implementation phase. I wanna put at the end of my talk, you have two more minutes, just our research, again, in the context of the old session uh, of the great talks by Diane and of course also Rob. And I wanna say, we have been focusing very much on the carbon cycle, on new ways, how to fix, capture, convert carbon dioxide. But of course, there's many other elemental cycles that are heavily influenced by us human beings. You might know nitrogen cycle, Right? You might know that phosphorus is an ending resource. We are hitting planetary boundaries and we're influencing all these cycles. At the same time, those cycles are, of course, influenced heavily and shaped heavily by microorganisms, which are the key players. And I think we should be just humble enough to learn from the experts, how the experts keep those cycles sustainable. And this might guide us uh, to new ways to heal the planet. And I think I've identified three challenges you might drive on in our discussion. I think one challenge would be, first of all, put forward by Diane, one thing we need to do is we need to bridge the scales in microbiology. On the one hand, on the right side, this is CO2 fixation, oftalonsinocotcystis chlorococcus, marine algae, right at the planetary scale, 10 to the seven. On the left side is research from our lab where we have identified how an enzyme can bind, capture and fix in carbon dioxide at the active side, 10 to the minus 10, 17 orders of magnitude of difference, but we still cannot connect the left side with the right side. And I think you might be those people that can come to unifying framework and can really come from atomic structures to global processes. Okay, we need to understand how things are connected from the smallest to the largest scale. Second challenge, of course, put forward by Rob, also by Diane. So what are all these freaking enzymes doing? We're discovering all the billions of genes and billions of proteins we can now predict. So what is their function? How flexible are they? What are they doing there? And I think this is one of the biggest challenges for me as a biologist. At the same time, one of the biggest joys for me as a synthetic biologist is to harness all this power of, of evolution, hopefully. But it's also a challenge for us as a community. How do we evaluate people who are really sitting there and trying to find a single function of a single gene? It doesn't give you sometimes a nature paper, but it's really important to do. How do we incentivize these efforts really and pay back those hard working biochemical people in the lab? And last but not least, of course, thinking of applying all these new enzymes in new context, how flexible are biological systems? Can we rewrite the code of life? Can we put in new functionalities? Can we basically uh, reprogram the operational system of cells? Or do we need to develop minimal cells like I showed you in the beginning to come to new functionalities? At the end of the day, I think, just to come back to microbiology, I think new solutions to environmental challenges of today can only be basically solved with the help of microorganisms. And I think that is my take home message and I hand over to uh, the panel and uh, I'm happy to take of course questions. Thank you so much.